Hello readers, this is for the novel study of the sign of the beaver, chapter two. So think about what has happened in chapter one. Here we go. By the next morning, the tight place in his stomach was gone. By the morning after that, Matt decided that it was mighty pleasant living alone. He enjoyed waking to a day stretched before him to fill as he pleased. He could set himself the necessary chores without having to listen to any advice about how they should be done. How could he have thought that the time would move slowly? As the days passed, he had cut one notch after another on his stick. Matt discovered that there was never enough time for all that he must be that must be done between sunrise and sunset. Although the cabin was finished, his father had let him the endless task of chinking the spaces between the logs with clay from the creek bank. So when you chink the spaces in log cabins, you know, the logs don't fit super tightly together, so there's always spaces between the log. So chinking is when he was taking the clay from the creek and he had to fill in all those little spaces. So that's what that means. At the edge of the clearing, there were trees to fell to let in more sun on the growing corn an underbrush that kept creeping closer over the cleared ground. All this provided plenty of wood to be chopped and stacked in the wood pile against the cabin wall. To cook a meal for himself once or twice a day, he had to keep a fire going. Twice in the first few days, he had, walked, he had waked to find the ashes cold. Back home in Quincy, if his mother's, if his mother's fire burned out, she had sent him or Sarah with her shovel to borrow a live coal from the neighbor. There was no neighbor here. He had to gather twigs and make a wad of shredded cedar bark, then strike his flint and blow on the tiny spark until it burst into flame. A man could get mighty hungry before he had coaxed that spark into a cooking fire. The corn patch needed constant tending. In these hot, bright days, Every drop of water that those green shoots demanded had to be lugged from the creek, a kettleful at a time, and there was no way to water the corn without encouraging the weeds as well. As fast as he pulled them, new ones sprang up. The crows drove him um, the cow the crows drove him distracted, forever flapping about. A dozen times a day, he would dash at them fiercely, shouting and waving his arms. They would just fly lazily off and wait on a nearby treetop till his back was turned. He dared not waste his precious powder on them. At night, wild creatures nibbled on the tops of the green shoots. Once he sat up all night with his rifle across his knees, batting at the mosquitoes. When morning came, he stumbled into the cabin and slept away half the day. That was the second time he let the fire go out. He seemed to be hungrier than ever before in his life. The barrel of flour was going down almost as fast as when two were um, dipping into it. He depended on his gun to keep his stomach filled. He was still proud of that gun, but no longer in awe of it. Carrying it over his shoulder, he sat out confidently into the forest, venturing farther each day, certain of bringing home a duck or a rabbit for his dinner. For a change of diet, he could take his fish pole and follow the twisting course of the creek or walk the trail his father had blazed into a pond some distance away. In no time, he could catch all the fish he could eat. Twice, he had glimpsed a deer moving through the trees just out of range of his rifle. One of these days, he promised himself he would bring one down. It was a good life with only a few small annoyances buzzing like mosquitoes inside his head. One of these was the thought of Indians. Not that he feared them. His father had been assured by the proprietors that his new settlement would be safe. Since the last treaty with the tribes, there had not been an attack reported anywhere in this part of Maine. Still, one could not entirely forget all those horrid tales. And he just didn't like the feeling he had sometimes that someone was watching him. He couldn't prove it. He could never see anything more than a quick shadow that might be a moving branch. But he couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was there. One of those pieces of advice his father had been so fond of giving him 
had been om had been about Indians. They won't bother you, he said. Most of them have left for Canada. The ones who stayed don't want to make any trouble. But Indians take great stock in politeness. Should you meet one, speak to him just the same as the minister back home. Matt had seen his father follow his own advice. Once, when they tramped a, a long way from the cabin, they had seen in the distance a solitary, dark-skinned figure. The two men had nodded to each other gravely and lifted a hand in salute, exactly as if they had been two deacons passing in the town square. But how could you be respectful to a shadow that would not show itself? It made Matt uneasy. He had grown used to the stillness and the fact he knew now that the forest is rarely quiet. As he tramped through it, he was accompanied by the chirping of birds, the chattering of squirrels, and the whine and twang of thousands of bothersome insects. And the night he could recognize now the strange sounds that used to startle him, the grunt of a porcupine rummaging in the garden, the boom of a great horned owl, the scream of sm some small creature pounced upon in the forest, or the long quivering cry of the loon from the distant pond. The first time he had heard that loon call, he had thought it was a wolf. Now he liked to hear it. Mournful as it was, it was the cry of another living creature. Matt would worm his shoulder into a comfortable spot in his hemlock boughs that made his mattress, pull the blanket over his head and shut out the mosquitoes and fall asleep well satisfied with his world. He would have liked, however, to have someone to talk to occasionally. He hadn't reckoned to, he hadn't reckoned on missing that. For much of the day, he was content to be alone, tramping through the woods or sitting on the bank of the creek, dangling his fish line. He was like his father in that, but there were times when he had thought he'd like to share with someone, with anyone, even his sister Sarah, though he never paid much mind to her at home. So he was not so quick-witted as he should have been when unexpectedly someone arrived. I wonder who that someone is. So as chapter two has ended, think about the five W's. Who is this chapter about? What is going on? Why are things happening? Where are they? And again, remind yourself of when is this taking place? Okay. So who? The chapter still focuses on Matt. What? What's going on? Well, he seems to be settling into his new um, routine that he set for himself. So think, think to yourself, what is that new routine? Why is this happening? As we found out in chapter one, he is alone for several weeks because his father had to go back um, home to Maine to get their, um, I think it's Maine, to get the family. Okay, and remind yourself of when this is. I believe it's around 1769 or the late seven, um, 1770 maybe. Okay, so keep thinking of those questions and we will come back for chapter three.